Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of Badcast. Today is Tuesday, May 10th, 2022. I am Rifat Manan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston. Today, we are very delighted to welcome back Dr. Fausto Rodriguez, who has been on this platform on many occasions. And needless to introduce him, so he is a professor of pathology at uh, UCLA David Griffin School of Medicine. So today he is going to continue his talk on uh, updates on the most recent WHO classification of GNS tumors. And this would be the third talk in the series. And today he is going to talk on ependymomas. And as always, please feel free to post your questions or comments on both YouTube and Facebook chat windows. And uh, I will pass them on to Dr. Rodriguez at the end of the session. So thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for joining us today. Over to you now. Okay, my pleasure. Always uh, uh, an honor and pleasure to be able to uh, spend uh, some time with you discussing some of the very exciting new developments and, uh, and complications of, of the WHO uh, that have affected our practice. So focusing on themes, I'm going to be showing some uh, nice cases of ependymomas, and in the context of trying to cover some of the uh, things that are new now uh, and that are practical for, uh, for all of us. So some of these slides I may have shared with you before. I've speak, spoken to you before on ependymal tumors. Uh, this is essentially an update. Uh, this is one of the hallmark papers. It's always good to, to go back and have it in, 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 uh, in, in the back burner because this was really uh, one of the large efforts that actually uh, was able to provide a lot of information that allowed teasing out certain uh, groups that have uh, clinical relevance. And, and this particular uh, is now a few years old, uh, 2015, I believe. This was a hallmark paper in which they profile a large number of, of ependymomas with uh, methylation profiling, and many of them had also some genetic data, uh, and they separated them in, in distinct subgroups, uh, and two of them were particularly teased out, which were the posterior falls at group A and the relafuse tumors, which were combined, accounted for most of the mortality of ependymomas, so that was a real important development. Uh, this is the figure from there illustrating the different type of uh, ependymomas. Uh, and it, there was an integration of anatomic compartment because in the past we used to grade tumors, uh, ependymomas as respective where they were. And our grading systems historically were not that powerful. And probably that was the case that we used, try to use standardized criteria across locations, but it looks like uh, a tumor in the, in the supratentral compartment is very different from one in the spinal cord. And that's particularly true in ependymomas. So they had several groups that were separated by location and then by important alterations. So, and they do have uh, uh, the other genetic drivers in um, age distributions and, and other features that are uh, irrelevant to, to the different subtypes in this uh, slide really uh, summarizes that. Now, in, back in 2016, uh, these were the categories. So there were subependymoma, mixopapillary. Ependymoma still had many of these morphologic subtypes, which we do see them, but now are considered more histologic patterns. So we'll move into that. So these groups have disappeared from the current WHO, but you do see these patterns that are relevant to talk about and, and interpret and know because they allow you to recognize these tumors as such as ependymomas, but they are, don't have are not felt anymore to have prognostic significance on their own. Uh, and then you had the Rela fusion uh, ependymoma and the anaplastic uh, ependymomas. So um, now this is a 2021. You see things are become a little bit more complex, but have incorporated more stringently these information, the anatomic information. You have the supratentorial groups, major groups, posterior fossa, and spinal. And then there are groups that have the alterations. You see, you, you still have room when you're not able to test for these. These fusions sometimes are very tricky to test for depending on the platform. So you may not be able to test for it or you may have um, um, 
uh, equivocal results, and you still are able to put tumors into the super uh, tentorial ependymoma category. The same with posterior fossa, like a group A, you do have a surrogate marker. We're going to talk about that, that you can use by immunohistochemistry. But the group B really is recognized by a global methylation profiling, which uh, not all centers offer. Spinal ependymoma, the same thing. Most of them you can uh, put in this category. Most of them have a, a very good behavior. Uh, but then you have a specific one. This is the one that is uh, meek and amplified, which doesn't have a grade, but most of the tumors do have a high grade histology. And one important development is that the mixopapillary ependymoma has been upgraded to a grade two. It used to be a grade one in the previous classifications. And now this has been become a grade two, recognizing that in a subset of tumors can, uh, particularly when they're subtotally resected or spilled into the CSF can cause recurrences and sometimes even extracranial metastasis. And so ependymoma can occur across different compartments and it's a, it's a category on its own as well. This is a nice uh, review uh, from a colleague, uh, Dr. Schuller, uh, showing uh, some of these, yeah, discussing some of the issues in the classification so that you can get further information if you like from that. Part of a nice cluster on the uh, of I mean, symposium on, the, on brain pathology of the 2021 WHO with selected uh, tumor types, and here they summarize uh, very nicely some of these uh, separate groups um, in age and uh, how aggressiveness and the criteria. That being said, let's go ahead and start with some cases. The first one is a 72-year-old uh, male. Uh, that presented with an intradural extramedullary mass at L1, L2. So we are dealing with the spinal cord right now. So we know now that uh, most ependymomas, uh, irrespective of site, have uh, characteristic morphologic features. Despite all these changes in molecular classification, we still uh, have a lot of uh, the morphology still gives you a lot of information and allows you to recognize it as such. Uh, this is, you can see at a low power, basic histology. You have these spaces around the vessels, uh, which you can recognize in permanent sections or even in frozen sections that are very helpful in recognition of ependymomas. The pseudorosets, or we call these perivascular pseudorosets, they are not the, um, um, they are not 100% specific, but when they are so conspicuous like this and the immunophenotype help, uh, confirms it, this uh, helps you put it in the category of uh, ependymoma. Uh, then you have to start looking for uh, features that may be concerning for higher grade, particularly um, mitotic activity. But this one you see here doesn't have that much my mitotic activity, is in the spinal cord. So that's always very reassuring because most of the spinal cord ependymomas do well in after a complete resection and most of them are low grade. Even when you have some limited proliferation, you tolerate a little bit more mitotic activity before starting to go into the direction of anaplasia in the spinal cord. Uh, we do have some immunostains here. DFAP is frequently positive in, in ependymomas. Uh, it's variable, but you do see that the tumors that have a lot of these perivascular pseudorosets, that's where you have the bulk of these GFAP immunoreactivity. These are processes, GFAP positive um, processes. Uh, they have a lot of intermediate filaments of GFAP and, um, and are recognized very nicely uh, by GFAP in most cases. And conversely, something that helps you also, uh, that helps a lot is OLIC2, because if you have a differential of uh, astrocytic neoplasm in uh, ependymoma, the, you see this is mostly negative. You have a few scattered cells in the middle, but you see the bulk of the tumor is negative. This is highly characteristic of OLIC2 in uh, ependymomas. This helps you, most astrocytic tumors and other you know, lower grade gliomas, glioneuronal tumors will have some OLIC2 positivity, even some uh, embryonal tumors. So um, this lack, that strong DFIP positivity and the lack of OLIC2 sometimes help you go in that direction uh, of ependymoma when everything is there. So it's, it's a helpful combination of, of, of stains. 
Um, this one is the K67 and you see it matches the histology and that you don't see much for mitotic activity. So this is very reassuring, low grade tumor. It's a tumor that excites a lot of the surgeons because they can resect it completely and certainly cure the patient that way. This is EMA and you see EMA sometimes uh, is helpful when it's present, but it can be very focal and, um, and altogether absent. Uh, so it's something to be prepared for. You have EMA and, and classically gives you a dot light positivity. This one, I believe, uh, it was either focal or, non, or, or not present. Uh, you can argue, and you have to look sometimes very carefully. You can argue there's a little bit of paranuclear staining there. Not perfect, but that's what are you looking for? Very nice dot-like or small lumina of EMA positivity, uh, which helps you with the uh, diagnosis. So the diagnosis here is a spinal ependymoma. So the anatomic compartment is in the diagnosis now. Uh, and this one is WHO grade two by a lot of features that I mentioned. Next case is a 31 year old woman with a recurrent spinal cord tumor. I uh, had a number of operations in the past. Uh, these are not the highest resolution images, but you do have some masses a little bit higher in the thoracic spine and some in the, sa in the sacral uh, region, lumbosacral region. And this is a tumor. And you can see that in contrast to uh, the other one that I just showed you, it looks blue at low power. Uh, you can have you, historically, you had the concept of cellular ependymoma. That was an ependymoma that was cellular, but not necessarily more proliferative, uh, which uh, still could be compatible with a grade two. This one is very worrisome. Um, it does, it's, it's cellular, blue at low power, and if you go on high power, you start seeing the cells have actually even prominent nucleoli are very odd. This one, when we uh, saw it, uh, ependymoma was not the first thing that you think about. You know, you think about a variety of different tumors. It does look ugly, it has a lot of apoptotic bodies and it had uh, areas of increased mitotic activity. Here you have some of the perivascular pseudorosets, which occasionally can be subtle in this case. You see here, here you have some that are breaking apart. So there are pendymomas in which you may not see all the diagnostic features that you are used to uh, seeing in classic ependymomas. Have areas here that look a little bit lower grade, but I tell you the differential here is, is uh, wide. This includes embryonal tumors, uh, high grade gliomas, um, the lymphoma will come back, come in the differential here um, if the cells weren't that cohesive. But um, you see the, the differential here, a lot of apoptotic bodies. And actually, this is a spinal ependymoma molecular testing was done that is MIC-N amplified. Uh, this was grade three. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the MIC-N amplified uh, spinal ependymoma is almost always associated with high grade histology. So you can go to anaplasia uh, many, most of the time by histology, but, um, but it's, uh, it, it, the, uh, it should not be the main criteria for grading. I think that's the grading is still uh, left open in the WHO currently, but most of the time when you see these, you're dealing with something that is bad. And you can see that that was a curse that this patient had, uh, had a lot of recurrences and, and, and dissemination. So uh, these satisfy criteria histologically for grade three, but in addition had this Mican Amplicon, which is associated with a, with a bad prognosis. And this is the main alteration that you're looking for, for prognostication in 
uh, spinal uh, cord ependymomas. Most spinal cord ependymomas look low grade. You may not even need to do molecular many times if you know if you don't have this accessible. Um, but when you see something that looks ugly, a little bit strange, you're putting it in the ependymoma category. Think about uh, doing Miken uh, um, testing. Next case uh, is a 39 year old woman. They have some neurologic symptoms and they were screening. These patients get screened a lot um, with uh, sometimes with brain images. And you can see that there is this here, this mass that is enhancing. This is an MRI post contrast. And you can see this irregular mass actually a little bit in the cervical, uh, cervical kind of in the foramen magnum in the interface with the posterior fossa and the cervical cord. So hey, whether, whether you can consider this a posterior fossa or a spinal cord one is can be sometimes a little bit uh, 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 problematic, but this uh, was actually still more inside and felt to be um, a posterior fossa type of tumor. And this is a tumor, the differential, there was uh, several items in the differential. They wanted to make sure that uh, metastasis was excluded. And you see, when you look at this, you might still start thinking, well, could it be metastatic? Then you have areas here that you can argue, well, there's some spaces there are a bit reminiscent of pseudorosets. There was this curious baculation, a little bit bland for metastatic carcinoma, but we wanted to discuss whether there was a possibility to see what type of carcinoma it was and, and maybe uh, look at side by side. And you had these actually these very curious kind of lumens here as well. The FAP was positive. In a more diffuse fashion. And keratin was negative. So other things that we were thinking about, could it be a choroid plexus neoplasm? But the lack of keratin essentially excludes it. Let's see what else, but this a variety of markers. So, and this is EMA. And here the EMA is very helpful because you start seeing some of these paranuclear staining. You do have this lumia. This is real. This is not artifactual. This is always very difficult to convince yourself that this is not artifactual. When you see the like staining and many different immunostains, you start thinking that it could be artifact. But you see, these are microlumens. This is very helpful in the identification of ependymoma, particularly morphologic types that are uh, that are difficult to uh, when the histology is not classic like this one. You see, you're starting to see look for microlumens. Um, so this one, uh, we were strongly favoring ependymoma. We were slightly descriptive in our diagnosis. And here, this is an, an even better area. This is very good to emphasize. You see that? A lot of microlumina and paranuclear staining. Not much for proliferation. And if you go back on H&E, you can gather that, that there are some areas that um, that this, uh, that have this, uh, you even have a little bit of uh, secretions almost, it almost looks like a some sort of secretory pattern of some kind. But you have this kind of 
eosinophilic material there. And some of that is EMA positive. Some of these represents microlumina, aggregates of microlumina actually, that uh, are reflected in the staining. Some, this is a little curious here, you see, but um, this is a lot of this is oftentimes EMA positive and you can see it in, uh, in ependymomas. Something to be aware of. A lot of oculation also here. So we were somewhat uh, descriptive favoring that and uh, took the next step in this case and send it for uh, methylation profiling. And it came back as an ependymoma posterior fossa group B um, in WHO grade two by histology. And also this group uh, tends to be associated with a, a better prognosis uh, compared to, uh, to group A. So it's one that uh, has uh, criteria, the strict criteria is by uh, methylation uh, um, profiling, gene expression ha has can, can identify them as well, but th those uh, non-methylation profiling is used more in a clinical setting for identifying these subgroups. So reassuring histology, reassuring uh, methylation profile, uh, the morphology was a little bit unusual. So here, uh, molecular help uh, a little bit to be more confident that we were uh, in this diagnostically, in the prognostically uh, favorable category. Next case is a three-year-old girl uh, with, presented with a fourth ventricular mass. This one, the slide was just a uh, return. It was a confirming console that I just saw recently. And um, uh, this is the some of representative images. You have areas in contrast to the other one that look very hypercellular here. Increased cellularity. There were also areas, here is a little bit darkly stained, but it, uh, it did have areas of prismatotic activity. A lot of pseudorosets, even in the cellular areas, very typical of ependymoma. The phenotype was very good for it as well. And it also had a loss of a trimeth H H3K27 trimethylation. You always want to use study this stain. You really want to make sure that you have a good positive internal control like vessels here. Uh, and that loss is a useful surrogate that allows you to recognize this tumor as a posterior fossa group A that occurs in usually young patients and that is associated with a more aggressive behavior and drives most of the mortality in a pediatric ependymoma. This one satisfied uh, historic grading criteria for grade three. Many of them are. So, uh, but this one we graded usually uh, using more historic criteria, finding areas of prismatotic activity. Uh, and then um, the surrogate marker. In this case, you can use that surrogate marker. If you're convinced that your co internal control is working well, your stain is working well, you can place it probably in this category using that immunostain because the loss characterizes uh, group A and group B it, it, uh, uniformly has preservation of, of these um, H3K27 trimethylation. There's also rare instances in which you do have ependymomas that have H3K27M, the, the actual mutation. Most of the cases with this loss, the group A, they don't have the mutation. They just have loss of the trimethyl group. That says sometimes it can become a little confusing. You need to make sure that you know which antibody you're using. The, the loss of trimethylation is what you're looking for for these. But there are some rare examples in which these tumors uh, may have the actual mutation. Uh, and it's a, it's a rare phenomenon that's still uh, being debated. But um, uh, the idea is that you have loss of the trimethylation in most instances you don't have the mutation in contrast to diffuse midline gliomas. Next case, 15-year-old uh, uh, girl uh, with a hemispheric mass. Okay.
This is the histology. Again, you can low, see a low power. You do have some pseudorosets. Uh, something subtle here, the pseudorosets are not that accentuated. It's something um, very um, characteristic of these. You do have the vessels. You can even argue they're slightly uh, chicken wire. Um, we are now, remember, we are moving into the supratentorial compartment. So um, now you have differential changes. You see all these very delicate kind of capillary branching, pseudorosettes that are not uh, that accentuated. That is something of a clue here. You can also argue that there is some uh, petty, uh, nuclear clearing. See, we can go on a higher power. So slight uh, perinuclear clearing. You do have mitotic activity in this case. Uh, these can remind you a little bit of even oligoendoglioma. You know, some of the high-grade oligoendoglioma can have a, some uh, similar morphologic features, particularly the capillaries and the clearing and uh, the, some, some monotony. So that's the differential here. The phenotype was that more of a ependymoma. And this in the past uh, we used to recognize as clear cell ependymoma. It's not a recognized subtype in the WHO. It's more considered now a pattern. But what is important, and when you see this morphology, is that it makes you think of um, the unfavorable C ZFTA fused tumors. There are some immunohistochemical markers that can help you identify it. Uh, one of them uh, is cycling D1. This was strongly positive here. They tend to be strongly cycling D1 positive. Uh, I wouldn't use it on its own to diagnose ependymoma or to do that. It's just another thing that you can do uh, and suggest, at least for, uh, be more strongly about uh, su suggesting molecular testing you need for the diagnosis, testing for, to test for the actual fusion. Um, there, are other, there are other also uh, surrogate markers uh, that have been proposed, some of them of the NF-kappa beta pathway. Um, so, um, and at least it can help you suggest strongly the, the, the possibility of the diagnosis and look into um, molecular testing. This is P16. And in addition to the ZFTA, something that has come up in recent years from, a, uh, from um, several groups, I believe uh, Torsten uh, Pich has also uh, um, worked, done some work on this and his colleagues is that the a CDKN2A loss in this. It's, it's one of the groups of tumors now that are also extending that in which CDKN2A P16 um, loss is giving uh, additional prognostic information because some of the ZFTA, the ones that in addition to the fusion have CDKN2A loss are the ones that actually tend to behave very, very bad. So uh, this one has, the immunostain for P16 is not the best surrogate marker that, that we have. I use it a lot to, 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 to gather, influence me a little bit more, go into the, the testing and the alterations and things and to correlate, to co correlate everything. But this one is so pronounced, the loss with good internal controls that, you know, I was worried and indeed, I, I believe this one had a CDK into a deletion, which adds another layer of prognosis uh, for these, um, these tumors. So this is a ZFTA. Uh, remember, these were in the in the previous WHO called uh, Herela fused, and it looks like the ZFTA is actually the the relevant partner because there's a, some tumors that can have Herela uh, rearrangements that don't fall into this category. Um, this one had criteria for grade three by others, but something also when you see something in the supratentorial compartment, young patients have to think about this. They um, uh, also the clear cell ependymoma, what historically has been called clear cell ependymoma, a large proportion of them belong to this category of ZFD uh, fusion positive tumors. Okay, case number six 
is a 10 year old boy with a three centimeter mass in the lateral ventricle. Another, so we are still in the supratentorial compartment. And you can see here the histology. What is remarkable, a low, a low power, is that you have a very pronounced papillary architecture. And um, on preoperative impression and imaging findings, this was uh, the, what they favor was a choroid plexus tumor of some kind. And you can see that you have a lot of very strong papillary architecture, but you do have pseudo rosettes that are very well developed. And where you can argue also some kind of almost appending on type of canals and surfaces. So um, you can see here more of this granular eosinophilic material that uh, you can see also in ependymomas that tend to be EMA positive. Not much for mitotic activity, but a lot of the tumor looks like this. See, we have some stains. Okay. This is GFAP, very strongly positive. There was a SOM CAM 5.2, and this is something that is important to highlight. Uh, it's not that strong in a, in a choroid plexus neoplasm, you expect to see a lot of um, keratin expression, but here the caveat is that ependymomas can have some. They can be positive for keratin sometimes. So that is something to include in CAM 5.2. So it's not, a, it's not a deal breaker for the diagnosis of ependymoma but you can see here more reactivity than you tend to see in, in normally in, in some areas, very pronounced keratin positivity. EMA, a little bit on the weak side. So you can see AMA, and I've shown you some several examples of uh, ependymomas that can have very weak or very focal EMA, or none at all. So that is something that you have to be prepared. It's not always present. When it's present, it's helpful, but when it's absent, you know, and depends also on the reactive, <clears throat> the strength of the reactivity for your immunos. Historically, uh, EMAs are validated to identify epithelial tumors and epithelia, the, while the expression in the, of EMA in, in ependymomas is lower. And in, the same goes for meningiomas. So um, it, it, that's, that's why sometimes you, you may have even negative EMA is another reason for it. The expression can be very low and not recognizable. So it doesn't really uh, exclude uh, the diagnosis. So this was a supratentorial ependymoma, WHO grade two, and you can argue that this had a papillary pattern. In the past, the 2016 WHO will recognize the papillary ependymoma as a group. Uh, now is considered a pattern. So the important thing is that supratentorial grade two and molecular testing was done to exclude some of the alterations, particularly RELA, 
or a CFT Rela uh, fusion and, and it was absent in this case, which was reassuring. Uh, then there's the another group that has, I, I believe it may have been tested for YAP as well, which YAP is the other, uh, another fusion that you can get uh, rearrangement of JAP in, in a subgroup of supratentorial pendymomas as well. That not, is, not, is not associated with, a, with bad behavior e uh, either in contrast to the CFTA. CFTA is the most relevant one that you want to identify because of its implications for, for prognosis over, over, over time. Next one is a 39 year old woman that had uh, persistent lactation and progressive blindness. And scans were done and identified a very large cellar, uh, supracellar mass that uh, was uniformly enhancing. And this is a tumor in many areas, looks spindly. Can I argue uh, you do have some vessels? A bit of a suggestion of pseudo rosettes in some areas. Fairly vascularized. Okay. Immunostains, GFAP. Kind of on the weak side. But this is EMA and you can see, this is one of the best examples of microlumina that you can encounter. You do have not only the dot-like positivity here, paranuclear, but you do have the outline of very nice lumina. Some of it is, can be chunky. Some of it, you can really see an actual lumen. This is what you, uh, this is very remarkable. You don't see it this good uh, that often. But a lot of these lumens, there was some subtlety. Um, let's go back to the H and E. Here you even have a little bit of epithelioid type of morphology. But you start to see some, uh, some of these maybe vessels, some of them maybe actually ependymal microlumina actually, 
And some of these, are, I'm sure, is being recognized by that uh, EMA. But epithelioid uh, type of morphology, you can see it in some uh, ependymomas, something to have in mind. Here, another subtle, you see uh, uh, probably some ependymal type of lumen. Now, what is distinct about this is in addition to that, you do have TTF1. So this is TTF1 expression and we're in the cellar region. So this, um, and it's uniformly so, uniform TTF1 positivity. So the diagnosis here is cellar ependymoma. And this is a rare type of neoplasm that conceptually uh, falls in this group of p cytomas. So p cytomas are tumors that glial neoplasms that are related in some ways to p sites, which are the um, glial cells that uh, have a supportive function in the neurohypothesis. So uh, conventional p cytomas are spindle cell tumors that have some glial phenotype, low grade, uh, but you have a spectrum of morphologies now of that can be related to that, uh, including spindle cell oncocytoma, granular cell uh, tumor, and as well as cellular ependymomas. So, um, and TTF1 seems to be a marker that we know now that recognizes a lot of neoplasms that tend to arise in that area. So, um, just something to, to, to have in mind. This was a little subtle in the HE, um, not the best form of pseudo rosette. So, that's something I want to emphasize that ependymomas, regardless of the site, some ependymomas can be GFAP negative or weak to negative almost, like this case. Uh, and, and EMA can be negative um, as well. So not a single marker excludes uh, ependymoma. For, so it's something to have in mind. And some of them that occur in this location, for example, can have TTF1 positivity. So the, you can have a lot of variety. You can have tumors that have very few pseudorosets, that have very little GFAP, that have EMA that is negative. Uh, and none of those alterations on their own or findings on their own uh, diagnosis or excludes ependymoma. The presence of true sets, good lumens, is one of the most powerful, probably, uh, features for recognizing them at the pathologic level. It's something to just to have in mind. But the others, you can have uh, various degrees. This is the final case. A 40-year-old woman that had a history of progressive headaches. And this uh, was the mass that was identified, a intraventricular mass with heterogeneous enhancement on axial MRI. Uh, this was a very difficult uh, case, actually, where we encounter it. Um, you can see what you're seeing at, at even high power, uh, intermediate power, and high power is a high grade spindle cell tumor. And most of these has um, the appearance you would call a malignant um, sarcoma, really. Raised mitotic activity, you almost see fascicle formation. But in addition, you had areas that look like this, um, that were more on the glial side or primitive side, if you, uh, at the beginning. So it did, ha it, it was biphasic in some ways. And uh, now this was a minority of the, of the tumor. And um, we did 
DFIP. I'm also a tumor is negative. And you can see it here. You do have a lot of staining here and something to be aware of that when you have a variety of malignant spinal cell tumors, sarcomas, they can infiltrate the brain a lot and you can get a lot of very bizarre reactive astrocytes and islands and things. So that doesn't make it uh, gliosarcoma or anything like that right off the bat, but you have to, but the, uh, conversely, you can have areas of glial differentiation that are very focal and you need to convince yourself. And here you see, this is not reactive. You have islands of tumors that are, of tumor cells that are strongly GFAP positive. At the time, our initial impression is that this was going to be just a gliosarcoma um, with a bifid in, in satisfied criteria, having both um, um, components. You have a malignant uh, spindle cell component that is GFAP negative and a malignant glial component that is GFAP positive. The reticulum stain is the opposite. You have areas that have very dense pericellular reticulin deposition, which is a feature of sarcomatose or mesenchymal differentiation. And then you start seeing islands that are reticulin negative. So that is, you do have criteria for what we recognize many times as gliosarcoma and the CNS. Now, what was unique here is that in addition to that, there was some EMA positivity. This is a little granular, but certainly real in paranuclear regions. So here a little bit more. So this actually is, is taking us in another direction. It's not just a conventional gliosarcoma. But we ended up uh, signing it out as ependymosarcoma, which is not a distinctive subtype. In, in the CNS, this is something that happens. It's still um, being studied. It, it's essentially it's a high grade ependymoma with sarcomatose differentiation. And this particular case had a variety of uh, karyotypic abnormalities. This is uh, NGS data on the case showing, uh, trying to capture um, the different uh, chromosomal abnormalities. You have gains, uh, quite a few gains of, of multiple chromosomes. That's, uh, you can see it in some subsets of, of, of ependymomas. Uh, and uh, importantly, had a NF2 uh, small uh, four base pair deletion that is uh, out of frame and therefore deleterious with a high VAF, which probably represents a loss of heterozygosity. So this was, um, it had an NF2 mutation, not many other mutations typical of, of gliosarcoma. Uh, so we were able to even further confirm NF2 is frequently altered in ependymomas. Uh, to everything was going that direction of uh, ependymosarcoma. This is a, a tumor in some ways group that we uh, studied uh, in the past when I was a fellow, actually. Uh, we were curious about these tumors that were having this variety of, of, um, of patterns. Uh, some of them even with osseous, uh, osteosarcoma type of differentiation. So very similar to what you see with gliosarcoma, except that the ependymal component uh, was uh, positive. And uh, this one, for example, had some alterations like NF2 and like uh, 1Q. At that time, most of what we could do was fish. So um, we were able to see some of the alterations typical of ependymomas uh, in, in some of these gliosarcomas in both the uh, ependymal and the sarcomatous components, similar to what we see in gliosarcoma. Uh, nowadays, we have different type of uh, molecular subgroups that are more objective and uh, there have been some rare reports of ependymosarcomas. This is one uh, example of, of actually uh, a CFTA uh, fused ependymoma, ependymoma that actually has a sarcomatous component. So the idea here is that when possible is nowadays is to try to place it in one of these um, category of tumors. Um, I believe the ependymosarcoma that, you that I showed you did not have that rearrangement, but 
Um, important to know that true ependymomas can have that type of alteration. It's not just a tumor that has a little bit of area that looks slightly ependyma by morphology, but that you do have true ependymomas that go bad. Uh, also, it's important not to call them gliosarcomas because in our experience, some of these, yes, they are high-grade tumors that can behave in a very aggressive fashion, but not to the extent that you will have a glioblastoma or a gliosarcoma grade four. So uh, still a lot to be learned from it, just to let you know that this is a curiosity that happens um, sometimes, and you can have either descriptive diagnosis or study it a little bit better, uh, if possible, with molecular. Okay, I think that's the end of the cases. I have a few questions here now that we can uh, discuss. Uh, question one, which immunohistochemical marker is a useful surrogate for posterior fossa group A ependymomas? Yeah, I will keep an eye on the uh, answers on Facebook and YouTube. So let us give them a couple of minutes. So I see some answers coming for option C, that is IDH1. Let me see more. Yeah, there are more C, IDH1. I'm, I'm sorry, I think it's a, actually H3K27 trimethylation is C. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so okay. sorry, let's see, yes. Well, that's reassuring because that's the right <laughs> answer. This is a surrogate marker that's very helpful. Again, with these tumors in which you see, uh, these markers in which you see loss, you want to make sure that you have a good internal control that is preserved and um, to be able to call it. But this is one in which you have a molecular subgroup of ependymomas that you can recognize with a nice immunohistochemical marker that you can validate in, you know, in, in, in an immunohistochemical lab. It's always very uh, um, reassuring when you can have markers that are powerful and that can help you um, prognosticate when the more complex technologies are not available or are uh, out of the, the reach of the pocket. Next question, mixopapular epidemias assigned what grade in the 2021 WHO classification? Yeah, I'm looking at uh, answers. So uh, I can see already People are calling grade two, that is uh, option B. Yeah, everyone is calling it uh, option B, that is grade two. All right, I'm happy that everybody's paying attention or reading uh, the updates uh, previously. So yeah, I was hoping to have at least, do, do we have any grade, any answer E? I was hoping to see if somebody <laughs> probably in a, no. with a sense of humor <laughs> uh, chose that. But <laughs> no. All right. It's more difficult to do this now that we are not using Roman numerals anymore. But in the, in the era of Roman numerals, you will have some occasionally higher grades than four <laughs> with, with the Roman numerals. So, uh, an oncogenic fusion involving which of the following genes characterizes a distinct subtype of ependymoma? Yeah, let us see what answers are coming. Um, I can see again, B as in, uh, there is both for B as well as C. Uh, yeah, there are more for C that is YEP1. And let me see, uh, it's variable. I think uh, there is D as well. Mm. I think, yeah, more for C. There are more... Uh, Answer going for okay. C. And that's correct. So JAP1 rearranged fuse ependymomas is, again, this is one of the sub subtypes of supratentorial ependymoma. So you have the CFT fuse ependymomas that have a bad prognosis and the JAP1 that don't have that much of a bad, they have a, a better behavior. So those are the two subgroups that are uh, subtypes that have their own category now in the WHO for supratentorial ependymomas. So MECAN is amplified, it's not a rearrangement, it's an amplification that happens in the spinal cord ependymomas. And if you have th uh, R3, you see it more in uh, astrocytic and uh, glioneuronal tumors. 
Um, BRAF, you can see it in many different tumor types, but yeah, for ependymomas, JAP1 is, is a distinct subgroup in the new WHO classification. And amplification in which of the following genes associated with high grade tumors and poor prognosis in spinal ependymomas. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I think um, most of our viewers are already going for D, that is MIC N. And let me see. Yeah, uh, majority of them are uh, opting for MIC N amplification. Yeah. And that is the answer, actually. So it's a distinct category now. So again, if you see a tumor that looks ugly in the spinal cord, think about it. Because sometimes the morphology is strange. You tend to get this new, to have this macronucleoli, which is actually a feature that you see sometimes with meat gains and other tumor types, like, for example, anaplastic metalloblastoma with a large cell variant. Looks, the cells have very prominent nuclear and they have frequent meat. Uh, that's more mix C amplification. So, um, so it looks like there's something that happens to the the, the mix amplification does to the cell, and, and, and they gain this very weird morphology. So, when you see an ependymoma that is actually high grade or something that doesn't quite look like an ependymoma but is in the differential, think about uh, doing uh, testing for mix. And again, it's one that is associated with a very bad prognosis. Most spinal cord ependymomas do in a, are more indolent or do are completely curable. By, by surgery, but this is the one that you have to worry about. And that's all I have for now. Um, if there are questions, I'm happy to take some questions. If there are additional questions that have come up in the in, in the chat. Yeah. No, thank you again, Dr. Rodriguez. I see one question on YouTube from Dr. Samdani, so who wants to know, what would be the one diagnostic histologic criteria to identify ependymoma on frozen sections? Uh, I am showing it to you now. <laughs> so uh, the smears are fantastic. So you, you, when you see the smears, you have all these processes that correspond to the pseudorosettes. They cling to the vessels. I mean, you see they have a glial appearance, but they are not, the cells are a little bit more epithelioidy looking than astrocytic tumors and they cling to these vessels that the smears, even a smear, particularly when you have very tiny specimens, sometimes what happens is that the, you have a differential when they start the surgery, particularly for spinal cord, and they may send you a very tiny piece just to, to see what they're dealing with. And it's good sometimes, the only thing that you can do is a, is a smear. And if you're able to do it, uh, this is very helpful information for them. So learning how to recognize them in smears is very useful because they will really take the time to resect this. They really need to clean it up. It's a tumor that is curable by resection. You know, you cannot say the same for many of these uh, astrocytomas that we see in the CNS, but ependymoma is something that the surgeon will take their care and time to completely clean it out. And sometimes if you have a very tiny one and you can do only do a, a, a smear, this type of pattern is, 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 is really very helpful. Now, frozen sections, if you have enough material, you can do it because they tend to be more solid. They, the frozen sections come out a, very, a little bit better than astrocytic tumors or infiltrative tumors. And what you're seeing is these spaces around the vessels. These pseudorosets at low power are very helpful in, in recognizing them. So you put in the context of the imaging preoperative impression, and then you have something that really has a lot of perivascular pseudorosets that clearing around the vessels that you can see a low power, that is a very strong clue also. It, they, this goes hand in hand. If you see now, it's not 100% specific, but if you see a lot of them, you can very, very uh, strongly suggest it. If you see true ependymal rosettes, uh, with many canals or lumens, that's almost diagnostic. You know, you can, I don't know, you can, uh, you know, as long as you, you know, you exclude an epithelial tumor, a MET or something like that, but something that has glial differentiation with ependymal lumina, that is really what defines ependymoma at the morphologic level. So uh, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. So uh, you may, it seems that you would like to suggest to our viewers who are in different parts of the world that when they do frozen section for mm -hmm. CNS tumors, which is quite common, of course, in practice, like, do you suggest that they should consider doing uh, imprints if they are not doing it already? I will. Uh, they give in, 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 this is an example where they so they are so helpful because the, the cytology of, of ependymoma is very is, is very characteristic. 
And I, if you have a very tiny piece and you freeze it, then you're, you, you know, it's gone next day. Uh, depends on how much material. I will advocate for doing both in essentially an every frozen section because you're getting cytologic information, very nice detail in, in those. And uh, in the, in the frozen section give you the architecture. So we're having that combination of information in the frozen section is very helpful. And ependymoma is very helpful. But if you have something very tiny, let's say you have a minute piece of tissue and you, it's going to be consumed and frozen, you don't know if you're going to get more, doing a smear and getting used to doing it is probably the best, the best bet. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. And our viewer, Dr. Samdani, is uh, adding that and seems very appreciative of your uh, advice about frozen section. And she says that it's helpful for GI pathologists like her who are not comfortable covering neuropath frozen. And I think that's something very important because not uh, many of us are like, you know, I mean, very comfortable. Uh, and we are not uh, practicing neuropath in our day to day practice, but we have to cover. Uh, neuropath for frozen, and we may not have someone in our department, like, I mean, at that particular time who can help us. So these uh, guidances are very helpful. So one question in that uh, direction is, for example, like, I mean, if one is not sure about ependymoma during frozen section, I mean, and what best so one can say uh, while giving frozen section diagnosis? That's right. You know, the most important thing is conversation. You, it's, it's good to, if you have uncertainty, it's good to convey it. And it, sometimes talking, talking to the surgeon is, is, very, is very critical in those, in those situations because they may tell you what the implications are. They may tell you, you know, you're, I'm going to resect it all together anyway, so you don't have to be sweating it, right? I mean, if they're not going to do very much, they, they're, they're, change, they're, they're going to change their approach, whether you so, clarify something or, or say it. That then there's no no point of you trying to risk or being a you know being what you say being a coward and you being a, a very definite diagnosis there just to 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 uh, to put it out there. You can be very you can call this glial neoplasm and and say to the surgeon, you know I am com I, I am concerned that this could be a pendymoma, but it's not classic. You know astrocytoma is still in the differential diagnosis, um, so I I prefer to be subtle. Sometimes there are pressures that you know, I really need to know. I'm gonna be more, and you can say, well, if you can give me more, <laughs> that, that way you can start negotiating. Give me more material, I can freeze a piece. I can probably give you more information. That's where that conversation helps. That's the art of frozen section because I, I tell you, I'm very vague many times in my diagnosis. I mean, I see this a lot and I advocate and you know, uh, a lot for frozen sections in the sense of, of uh, I, I present a lot on it. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot in, in, in my career, but I am very, very careful with, with how I, I, what I write down in a sense, because you don't want this to be taken to the patient later and say, you know what, you know, I told you, you know, we would tell you it was this and, and it, it turns out not to be that. Now we, we live in the molecular era. You may not even do molecular yourself, but this may go to another institution where it's done. So I, a lot of things you have to see the implications of what happens down the line. It doesn't mean that you, you know, there are things that you still can solve with morphology and frozen sections. But if you are in a situation that you're not sure, convey it. Glial, glial neoplasm, you know, I'm, I'm favoring ependymoma, but it's still not classic. You know, I will prefer to defer for permanence. And the surgeon may reassure you and might tell you, you know, oh, that's great to know. You know, it's not going to change very much. You know, already we're closing the patient. Sometimes you go there and you sweat a lot and you go and talk to the surgeon and say, right. we're closing, you know? So, I mean, that, you know, so you say, okay, you know, so I, then you can go ahead and write it out in the most careful way that you can, you know? And, and I think that's what should be, that's my, that's usually the, my approach to frozen section practice. Now that's good to know from you. Like, I mean, uh, as you have been uh, so experienced in dealing with such situations uh, and, uh, um, as you say, like, I mean, do you think that uh, taking help of looking at radiologic features will also help a little bit while dealing with such situations? Uh, absolutely, in particular in the frozen section setting. Now, what I say uh, to everybody is, is not is the, the issue here, even if, if you uh, do exclusively brain tumors, it's not to be a radiologist. You know, you're not a, a, a radiologist and you're not expected to be that. You cannot try to make a lot of interpretation yourself. It's good to learn and to learn to communicate. 
uh, but it's uh, knowing what the, the radiology is, is is very helpful. I mean, because you know exactly where you are just by knowing where it is. You know, sometimes um, you know it, it, it absolutely helps. Uh, so it, it really helps that it helps with quality control. It, they may tell you that a tumor looks one way, but you see something in, in frozen section that's completely different. Then, you know, the frozen section can be a very stressful place. You have quality control. You may say, well, maybe, you know, sometimes that is the clue that you're looking at the wrong case, you know, that, you know, that you have a mass in X place, but you have a history that's completely mismatched and you may be looking at the right slides. I mean, and that happens to, it can happen to any of us, you know, so quality control, it, it can give you, it narrows your differential. I've, I've seen cases in which, for example, for whatever reason, I, I you know, it, we're, it's moving fast. And they tell you, you know, tumor and you look at it and you say, wow, this is a bizarre thing. You have a wide differential, but then they tell you, no, this is in the, you know, in the, in the pituitary gland. Then your, your differential narrows significantly, you know, because you can have a lot of morphologic variation in pituitary adenoma. So very little details like that, where it is and uh, can help you a lot, age and the appearance, you know, um, uh, it can, can help you quite a bit. The, the ependymosa, in, in, now that we're, that's the topic of the day, they are very circumscribed tumors. They are very circumscribed tumors at the morphologic level and at the radiologic level. And that, that, that can help you a lot also. Sometimes you can see these large tumors that actually extend across the spinal cord. So knowing what that is, what I recommend is not trying to do a lot of interpretation of the radiology if you're gonna make the clinical decisions, but to look at them yourself, it's a good, it's a good exercise, but also be aware what the, the report, the formal report has been. So you don't try, you know, because that, you know, that, that's, that's their, you know, they have to be very um, um, concerned that, you know, that the, the specialists, they, that's what they do every day and they're they the experts in that. And uh, it's important to, to interpret the findings in their context. I read, I look at them and read the reports conjunctly and, and, and then I, I use it in the context and be prepared for that if, either before the frozen section happens in the day or, uh, during and and it's going to make you prevent you from doing uh, bad mistakes all right thank you thank you dr rodriguez this is a very good suggestion especially coming from an experienced neuropathologist like frozen sections are often handled all over the places by general pathologists and i think like as you suggested that uh, to have a holistic approach like talking to the surgeon looking at the radiology looking at the radiologic report and the patient details etc will actually help us a lot rather than just looking at the slide and then trying to make a morphologic diagnosis uh, within that short period of time may not be a very smart idea, right? Yeah, and, and it's highlighted by ependymomas. Now you know that the vision is now, you know, the anatomical department, this is something relatively new. Where is located anatomical supratentorial versus posterior fossa versus spinal cord? That by itself is, is a different diagnosis, right? I mean, it's a different group of uh, tumor type. Now, just by location, it's in, intrinsic to the diagnosis. So that information is very important to have it, you know, when, when you are going, starting at a frozen section from the very beginning. So, the, you know, that's, uh, it's very important to have that. So, but, um, you know, I'm very happy that, the, you know, that the, there's some, some questions about frozen section. I didn't highlight it today. I've been doing this series more to provide some of the updates for the WHO, you know, that since it's so recent and, and to try to make sense out of it uh, with some, uh, some cases, but uh, I have done some podcasts before and interoperative approaches and I'm, I'm happy to update it and, and give an updated one in the future uh, since there seems to be some interest in that, so. Yeah, no, that would be great. Definitely we can arrange something on interoperative interpretation of these tumors, absolutely. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. I think uh, we don't have any more question on online for you, but uh, this was really great. And uh, I would uh, let you know that our viewers have expressed their thanks and they actually appreciated the case-based presentation. So many of them uh, especially mentioned that enjoyed case-based presentation mm -hmm. and tips and uh, things like that. And I think, um, there are friends of yours who say that uh, who says hello to you and say that they are going to reach out to you soon. So, oh, <laughs> thank so, you. And hello to you me. as well. <laughs> thanks a lot and thanks to our viewers so for all your support uh, to Patcast and our lectures. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, there were several hundred viewers from across the world who joined, and uh, you would be happy to know that. And for our viewers, and uh, our next lecture is 
coming on May 24th. That would be a dermatopathology lecture. And our speaker will be Dr. Manu Singh, who would be uh, delivering the lecture from India. He's a retired, I mean, he was a former chair of pathology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. And he's going to uh, present a general approach to dermatology or dermatopathology, like basic terms and uh, clues to morphologic diagnosis. And that would be very helpful, especially for the trainees. So hope to see you then. So again, it's on um, May 24th. So thank you again, Dr. Rodriguez. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thanks to everybody for, for viewing. Thank you.